This is Babylon, now in ruins. Greece. Hong Kong. Thailand. Lebanon all bear marks of ancient Babylon, and it has affected your life too. Do you know how? This film, proclaiming everlasting good news around the world, will give the answer. Come with us to New York, where plans are being laid for a world tour that will enable you to see the answer with your own eyes. In these red brick buildings is located the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses, who proclaim the vital message of the Bible. Brother Knorr, as president of the Watchtower Society, discusses arrangements with two other officers of the society. Plans are laid for a Christian convention to travel around the world. Brother Souter expresses enthusiasm for the profound impact that proclaiming the everlasting good news in this way will have. Brother Franz gladly accepts the invitation to go along with this traveling convention as one of the principal speakers. Now Brother Knorr offers to outline the trip on a wall map, starting with the first assembly in Milwaukee. The second in New York will draw delegates from South America. To London, delegates will come from as far away as Africa. Three conventions in Europe will care for that area as well as Spain and Portugal. A tour of the Bible lands will be an outstanding feature of the trip, and Brother Franz heartily agrees. Conventions will be held in India, Burma, and Thailand. Here the group will separate. The south route through Australia will be taken by Brothers Franz and Souter. The northern route along the China coast will be taken by Brother Noor, going as far as Japan and Korea. Both groups will meet again in Hawaii. The last assembly will be at Pasadena. But in Milwaukee, the assembly will begin our Around the World Proclamation of Everlasting Good News. On its city hall, Milwaukee expresses its welcome to us. By coming together in these assemblies, we are obeying the Bible command not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together. Whatever the Bible commands is what Jehovah's Witnesses want to do. That is why they have gathered here in County Stadium for the first of 24 conventions around the world. From this beautiful platform built for the occasion, Brother Knorr emphasizes that the Bible is our guide in all matters of worship and life. That Jehovah's Witnesses respect it is evident from the fact that they magnify the name of its author, Jehovah. The conventioners hear how the Bible is beneficial for all mankind. These people recognize that through its pages our Creator is speaking to us. It is the basis of their worship. This book, All Scripture is Inspired of God and Beneficial, will help people to get a good appreciation of the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses receive the book enthusiastically because their desire is to make God's Word strong in the hearts of the people. It contains good news that is for the benefit of you, too, if you follow its guidance. Now we come to the eighth and final day of this convention. 
Brother Knorr speaks to an audience of more than 57,000 people about the good things the Bible foretells for the time when Jehovah God is king over all the earth. It is for that time that you pray when you say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That kingdom is our hope for lasting peace. The Bible has many prophecies telling us about the benefits of that righteous government. Under its rule, no wars will ever trouble mankind again. All people living then will love one another, just as the Bible instructs. They will be closely united with one another. After describing these blessings, Brother Knorr releases a copy of his speech. The booklet also draws attention to ancient Babylon, that city that has affected even your life. It was there in Babylon that a movement originated that strives to deprive you of the blessings your Creator has promised through His kingdom. So, really, the purpose of this Around the World Assembly is not only to spread the good news about this kingdom, but also to help people identify this movement that is working against their interests. As the convention in Milwaukee concludes, the next one begins here in New York. In New York's Yankee Stadium, at the second stop in the Around the World Assembly, over 67,000 proclaimers of this vital message have assembled on the first day. Some are here from Canada, others from Central and South America. A total of 89 lands are represented. In a nearby auditorium, a Spanish assembly is being held that duplicates the program here in the Yankee Stadium. The multitudes you see here have learned that true worship cannot be based on just their own ideas. It must be in harmony with the Bible. That is where the Creator reveals how He wants to be worshipped. In an upbuilding talk, Brother Nor stresses the importance of Bible distribution. The fundamental work of Jehovah's Witnesses is not only to put the Bible in the hands of the common people in a language they can read, but also to help them to understand it. For those who speak Italian, Dutch, French, German, Portuguese, and Spanish, he releases copies of the Bible in those languages. These translations have the Creator's name, Jehovah, in contrast to some translations that cut it out. Here is one of the language groups to whom he presents copies of these Bibles. These Dutch-speaking delegates discuss the fine features of the Dutch version of the New World Translation. Brother Franz explains the importance of true worship to this responsive crowd of Bible lovers. He encourages them to use the Bible, which makes clear that the worship that is acceptable to the Creator directs attention to Him rather than giving glory to men. It sets men free from bondage to religious errors. Brother Knorr continues this theme of true worship and proposes a resolution so the assembly can express itself in favor of true worship and in opposition to the false, which is not in harmony with the Bible. Rather than fostering a materialistic attitude, true worship puts the emphasis on spiritual values. It provides a sound basis for happiness and contentment that is reflected in our everyday life. It is such worship that is set out in the Bible. It is this that Jehovah's Witnesses advocate.
During his talk, Brother Knorr focuses attention on ancient Babylon and releases the new book, Babylon the Great Has Fallen, God's Kingdom Rules. Babylon was the first city after the flood of Noah's day, and its founder was Nimrod, who left an impression upon mankind that has extended far beyond his day. As the conventioners rise to join in a song, some of us begin thinking about travel to the next assembly. There are 583 who will follow the assembly around the world. Another group of 520 will go as far as Palestine. Some of the delegates are already heading for London, England, where the next assembly is to be held. We go to the airport by bus. The Watchtower Society has outlined every detail of the trip. In the lands where this assembly will take the good news, a deep impression will be made. As we go with it, you will see the things that affect your life. We are on our way to London. Representatives from 57 lands arrive here in England for the Everlasting Good News Assembly. Among other places of outstanding interest, we see Parliament, where laws are made, and it is interesting to learn some of these laws made by the state control the operation of the Church of England. Here is a site you will recognize, Big Ben. Nearby is Westminster Abbey, a noted place of worship for the Church of England. Its nearness to Parliament well depicts the close tie this church has with the state, its leading clergyman even being appointed by the Queen. Across this bridge lies another part of the city. As we travel along the left side of the street, of course, we cannot help but think of the millions of people living in England whose lives are affected by this close relation between church and state. But in the hustle of their everyday life, like people all over the world, the majority here do not actually realize the extent of this influence. Windsor Castle has long been a home for English royalty. Whenever a member of royalty has been put on the throne, that one has been crowned by the church. In some ways the state has power over the church, while in other ways the church influences the state. Traditional British pageantry is continued by this military guard. One of the fruits of church-state union is evident in this park, where a plaque commemorates William Tyndale. Because he translated the New Testament into English, the clergy used the state to force him to flee to Belgium, where he was martyred by those who would deprive the people of God's word. His dying words were, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. This man wanted to give everyone a chance to learn about God. Like Tyndale, these thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses gathered at Twickenham Stadium are interested in the Bible. Brother Franz urges them to continue to show keen interest in their fellow men. It is for this reason that they take God's written word to the people in their own language and, in addition, help them to understand it. Brother Nor stresses the importance of reading the Bible and checking in it what anyone says about the Creator. He tells his audience, Our wisdom for eternal salvation lies in faithfully studying and using Jehovah's Book of Everlasting Good News. New Bible editions are presented to them. 
Jehovah's Witnesses use and distribute nearly all Bible translations. In addition, every year, the Watchtower Society actually publishes millions of Bibles and books, booklets and magazines that aid in the study of the Bible. Unlike those who persecuted Tyndale and tried to deprive people of having the Bible, Jehovah's Witnesses are eager to help people to lay hold of the blessings that God's Word holds out to you too, if you have faith. The new Bible editions are here distributed to convention delegates. Here in the British Museum, let's look at some old Bible translations and manuscripts. Did you know that the Catholic Church was so angry about translation of the Bible into a language the people could read that she had readers of it burned at the stake? Wycliffe's Bible was one of those Bibles. The Alcuin Bible is in Latin. Greek language Bible manuscripts such as the Sinaiticus and Alexandrian have helped to give us more accurate translations of God's Word. Leaving the museum, we go to the Watchtower House. This is the headquarters of the Watchtower Society in the British Isles. This branch helps in furthering the proclamation of the everlasting good news. This building houses the Kingdom Ministry School in Britain. We, along with the many others who have come to visit, are going to take a look at this building. These people are interested in this place because they distribute the Bible literature produced here. Let's not leave the youngsters out of it. Their parents are teaching them, too, how to use these publications to help others. These volunteer workers, all of whom are ministers living here, are wrapping copies of the Watchtower and Awake magazines for mailing. The British branch of the Society is but one of 98 branches that oversee the worldwide proclaiming of the everlasting good news. The Watchtower Society's branch office in Sweden oversees the proclaiming of the everlasting good news in this land. Many here in Stockholm for the assembly have been visiting the branch where they saw the Watchtower and Awake magazines printed in Norwegian and Swedish. Isn't Stockholm a picturesque city? Built on 14 islands, it is called the Venice of the North. There are many congregations of Jehovah's Witnesses here. But what about the people in general? What is their religion? As in England, they have a state church, but here it is Lutheran. Lutheran church affairs are handled through a department of the state and the king is the head of the Swedish Lutheran Church. On the outskirts of the city of Stockholm, Jehovah's Witnesses have built this temporary tent city in order to house some of the delegates to the Everlasting Good News Assembly. Others, of course, stay in private homes throughout Stockholm. For eight days, these in the tent city have been living here happily, not minding tent life at all. Witnesses from four nations are camped here, and this well illustrates how true worship reaches over national boundaries and unites people of all different languages. It has taught these people to live together in peace, to trust one another, and to be interested in the welfare of one another.
This cloverleaf type of speaker's platform emphasizes the multilingual design of the assembly. Each section has a translator. One is for Swedish, another for Danish, another for Norwegian, and the fourth one for Finnish. Brother Nor must pause long enough to allow for his words to be put into these various languages. Each of the four sections of the stadium holds one of these language groups. The Danes are here on the right. Next come the Norwegians. Then the Swedes and finally the Finns. A fully automatic synchronizing instrument was constructed by the witnesses that indicates when the translators are finished so the speaker can continue. The simultaneous use of different languages at this assembly draws attention to the fact that the good news is now proclaimed by Jehovah's Witnesses in well over 160 languages. Working in these Scandinavian countries are graduates of the Society's Gilead School located in New York. Some were brought to the school, given an advanced course on the Bible, and then sent back to oversee the preaching work in these countries. At the Stockholm airport, we board a plane for Munich, Germany. Delegates are gathering there from most of Europe and many other lands. Separate assembly halls have been arranged for the Dutch and the French. From Munich's airport, we go to the assembly grounds where a revolving globe depicts our world tour. Now here's something different. Just a few weeks ago, this was a large open field, but Jehovah's Witnesses have put up all the facilities to care for this crowd of more than 100,000. Now, can you see any reason why anyone should oppose the gathering of these peaceful Christians? Well, the Protestant and Catholic clergy in Munich did just that. They warned the people against renting rooms to these Christian delegates. But here we are, and Brother Knorr is urging the assembly to take the Bible and its message to the people of Munich. Yet the clergy have shown that they want to deprive the people of that help. So unchristian were their actions that a local newspaper told the people not to listen to the voice of the shepherds of the church, but rather to the voice of the Good Shepherd, who once said, I was a stranger, and you sheltered me. From the assembly grounds, many delegates go out to preach to the people of Munich. They talk to everyone. This young man is a German witness, and with him is one of the group with whom we were traveling around the world. They are pointing out what the Bible says about God's kingdom. This is what the clergy in Munich sought to keep from the people. On a tour after speaking with some of the people of Munich, the delegates see this fascinating tower. Looking at this, you may find it difficult to believe that here in Germany, thousands of lies were snuffed out in concentration camps. For years, Jehovah's Witnesses were persecuted in a vicious manner. Dachau was one of the camps Hitler used for exterminating millions of Jews and others. In this one camp, more than 29,000 died. Many of them were Jehovah's Witnesses who refused to renounce their faith. Some were kept in these buildings. This plaque marks the pistol range where thousands were shot to death. 
Their blood was drained off in this trench. Others were killed by the brutality of sadistic guards. The dead bodies were shoved into ovens here in the crematorium. Although the Pope of Rome was petitioned by Catholics to excommunicate Hitler, who was a baptized Catholic and had the support of the Catholic Center Party, the Pope refused to act. The ovens continued to burn and the concordant between the Catholic Church and the Nazi state remained in force. In mass graves are buried the ashes of the thousands of unfortunate victims of this devilish camp. It was the product of a religious nation that manifested the fruits of false religion. The fiendish effort to stamp out true worship in Germany failed, as this assembly with over 107,000 has clearly shown. Let's move on now to Italy the next assembly stop. In Milan, Jehovah's Witnesses gather in this fine stadium. Delegates are here principally from Italy, Switzerland, France, Belgium, Spain, and Portugal. These people too, as in Munich, met with opposition to their assembly. Again, the religious clergy opposed true worship by warning people against giving these witnesses sleeping accommodations, even though they were offering to pay for them. A sign posted on one Catholic church even accused the witnesses of not being Christians. But this did not dampen their enjoyment of the assembly. The society's branch servant of France, who is a graduate of Gilead School, gives words of encouragement to the assembly. They have reason to take courage because they have the approval of Jehovah God. The platform is arranged so talks can be given in Italian, French, Spanish, and Portuguese all at the same time. Through interpreters, Brother Knorr talks about the importance of Bible distribution and urges his audience to place the Bible with people in their own language. The Italian translator is a graduate of Gilead School. These people live in a country where there has been an upsurge of communism. Many people believe that the Roman Catholic Church is the last bulwark against this materialistic tide. Yet here in Italy, where that church has directly influenced the lives of the people for centuries, 25% of the votes recently cast were for communists. What about the people gathered at this assembly? Have they also forsaken their faith in God for communism? Not at all because they adhere to the Bible. The release of the New World Translation in their languages is a thrill to the delegates. Here some of them are excitingly examining its features, noting with pleasure its plainness of speech. They are anxious to take it to people. In four languages, this sign announces an event that is very important to Jehovah's Witnesses. Immersion in water is a public declaration that a person has made a dedication of himself to Jehovah God as Jesus Christ did. Baptism shows that a person knows what Jehovah God requires of him. By going under the water, these people are showing that they have died to their former course and will henceforth live in harmony with the will of God as set out in his holy word, the Bible. One of the things Jehovah God requires of those who are dedicated to him is that they proclaim the everlasting good news at the homes of the people. Here we are calling at a typical Italian home. We seek to build up the householder's appreciation of scriptural truths which can lead her to everlasting life. On a tour of Milan, 
we see one of the outstanding cathedrals of the Catholic Church, noted for its impressive artistic beauty. Observe the many spires on it. Most churches in Christendom have such spires or steeples, don't they? Do you know why? Later on, we will show you evidence of their origin. But now, we're going to leave Milan and head for Greece. Among the many beautiful temples in Greece is this one to the goddess Athena, called the Parthenon. But more than outward beauty should be your basis for judging a form of worship. You should use the Bible, the standard of true worship. Attracted by the beauty of this temple, different religious organizations, including some that profess to be Christian, have used it for their worship. But the impressive architecture did not make the worship endure. Many of the ancient temples in Athens are now in ruins. Some of their pillars have fallen, and this one is assembled to show you how it was built. Around the base of this high place of pagan worship lies the city of Athens. As in Munich and Milan, so here the clergy fought against the Everlasting Good News Assembly. The Greek Orthodox clergy forced the Greek government to cancel the permission it had granted to Jehovah's Witnesses for their assembly. This union of church and state has sought to deprive the people of Greece of good news that this assembly is proclaiming around the world. This empty stadium, where the assembly was to be held, is evidence that the Greek Orthodox Church, like the pagan religions before it, uses the state to persecute those who uphold true worship. This is the temple of Hephaestus, the fire god, his worship was like that in ancient Babylon, this temple we see from Mars Hill. This plaque records a speech given on Mars Hill by the Christian Apostle Paul. And why was he here? Because he was being persecuted and was on trial for his preaching. The truth he preached defeated the purpose of his persecutors so that even one of the judges and others who heard him became believers. From Athens, we go by bus to the city of Corinth in the southwest portion of Greece. As we near Corinth, we cross this canal, a valuable shortcut that connects the Gulf of Corinth on the north side with the Saronic Gulf on the south. Corinth lies to the west. This city in which Paul preached is nothing but ruins today, including its citadel that was on top of the mountain. From here we walk to the central marketplace or agora of ancient Corinth. Along its edge were many shops and restaurants. The worship of the goddess Venus was popular in this city. Now what was involved in her pagan rites? Well, she was served by a thousand temple prostitutes, and people then believed that it was proper. So today, sex is glorified and loose moral conduct is acceptable by many, even by professed Christians. What a contrast there is in the worship that the Apostle Paul advocated. It caused many to change their way of life, but it also drew the opposition of the advocates of the false worship. Like the Archbishop of Athens who threatened mob violence against Jehovah's Witnesses, so religious opposers in Paul's day mobbed him and brought him before the proconsul Galileo. The Bema is the elevated place before which Paul stood. 
It was a beautiful structure covered with marble from which high officials spoke to the people. The mob action Paul experienced was not unusual. Violence is the only answer false religion has to true worship. From these ruins of the Temple of Apollo, we begin to make our way to the seacoast to the east, where we find the ruins of the port city of Sancria. This was the city from which the Apostle Paul boarded a ship for Palestine at the end of his second missionary tour. After a last look at these ruins, we leave Greece, headed in the same direction Paul was, and on a trip that may change your life. We are in Lebanon now. As we look at some of the transport used, we see evidence of the past. And in the ruins of the past, we will see unmistakable marks of the influence of ancient Babylon on religion. Baalbek, in ancient times, was a famous place of worship. It was sacred to the people who came here. Up these grand stairs to the temple area, worshippers flocked, moved by the impressive beauty of the place. The worship they practiced was an ancient one. On this site, the Greeks and the Romans built temples, and later a Catholic church and a mosque was created here. But the worship was far older. It bore the marks of ancient Babylon. For example, here is the temple of Bacchus, the god of wine. People once gathered in this place for worship. Picture this courtyard filled with throngs of worshippers. What did their religion mean to them? Certainly, as they stood in this colonnade and viewed its grandeur, they did not think of Babylon because Babylon was no longer a world power. They probably did not even realize that their god Bacchus was really Nimrod, who as the founder of ancient Babylon has been deified there. The Bible speaks of him as a mighty hunter and a builder of imposing cities, one who opposed the true God. He was the builder of the lofty Tower of Babel. From Babel, that religion spread. But why? When Jehovah thwarted the efforts of Babel's builders by confusing their language, they scattered, and wherever they went, their religion went with them. But with new languages came new names for their gods. Their descendants built the temple of Bacchus that you saw, and this one to Jupiter and what temples they were. Look at the size of these pillars and the ornate carvings of the cornice work. No effort was too great. Sixty-foot columns were used in this temple, each with a span of seven feet. But why such buildings? To the Romans, Jupiter was a supreme god. His worship was even promoted by the state. How like Nimrod of Babylon. But the alliance of religion and state did not save Babylon, did it? Nor did such an alliance preserve the Roman religion here, as these ruins testify. And what have we seen in Europe? Church-state alliances bring grief. As we walk away from the Temple of Jupiter, there is something else we should know. Jupiter was also featured in mother and child worship. Does that sound familiar? Most of the people who worshipped in these buildings no doubt never knew that the idea came from Babylon, where like worship centered around Nimrod and his mother. So today, most people have never been told that adoration of the Madonna and child was borrowed from Babylon.
And that is not all. Does your religion feature a triune God? Many do, not only in Christendom, but also among the pagans. Jupiter was viewed as part of a trinity. Why so? Because the worship of Jupiter came from Babylon, which featured trinities. The oneness of their principal triune God was symbolized by a triangle. Is it not the same today? Labeling the Trinity with names from the Bible does not change the origin. It came from Babylon. Leaving Baalbek, we see a farmer threshing grain, the same as what was done in ancient times. The sled on which he rides separates the wheat from the chaff. So too, the proclaiming of the everlasting good news separates worshippers of the true God from those who cling to the religious forms of Babylon. In the same countryside are cedars of Lebanon. These trees were renowned throughout the ancient world. It was to these forests that Solomon, the king of Israel, sent for timbers to build a temple in Jerusalem. But it was not a temple for Babylonish worship. It was built for the worship of the one who is the creator of heaven and earth, the one who makes even these trees grow. Only a few of these trees can now be found, yet at one time the mountains were covered with them. Some of these that remain measure as much as 40 feet in circumference, and their branches stretch out like arms. How stately and majestic they stand. They are beautiful, aren't they? Having seen the beautiful cedars of Lebanon, we must now head for Jerusalem. From the air we see the Jordan River snaking its way from the Sea of Galilee down to the Dead Sea. It was in the land you are looking at that Jesus Christ taught 1,900 years ago. He revived true worship, the worship that Jehovah God himself had taught men at the time of creation. Near this spot in the Jordan River he was baptized, symbolizing his dedication to Jehovah, the true God. The Dead Sea, on the other hand, well depicts the effect of false religion. Though you can swim in this water, you cannot drink it. It cannot sustain your life. It is the Dead Sea. And eternal death is what false religion brings to its followers. But true religion is life-giving. That is the worship that Jesus Christ restored. Near the Dead Sea, we go to visit caves where ancient Bible manuscripts were found in 1947. From our vantage point, we can see where these copies of the inspired Word of God were found. And the fact that these scriptures contain reliable prophecy stamps them as of divine origin. Jesus Christ recognized their truthfulness and often quoted from manuscripts such as these. On at least two occasions, Jesus passed through Jericho, the city of date palms, as he traveled from the Jordan up to Jerusalem. Here he would be reminded of an event recorded in the Holy Scriptures. It was at the time that Israel first entered Canaan, not far from here. But why the ruins? After the Israelites had marched around the enemy city of Jericho for seven days, Jehovah miraculously caused the walls to fall and the practicers of Babylonish worship were destroyed. But there was one who showed faith, Rahab, who became Jesus' own ancestress. 
The part of the wall where her house was built did not fall. Archaeology confirms that part of the original wall stood firm. Nearby was a place that would remind Jesus of another miracle. The waters of the spring of Jericho were not fit to drink, but through his prophet Elisha, Jehovah caused them to be healed, and they are still healthful. Would you like a drink? From Jericho, we come up here to the Mount of Olives, just east of Jerusalem. To the south of the city, we see Gehenna, or the Valley of Hinnom. That's it, running up through the center of the picture. Because refuse was destroyed here, Jesus used it to illustrate the fate of false worshippers like Nimrod. That is why he said to the hypocritical clergy of his day, how are you to flee from the judgment of Gehenna? There on the left is the Valley of Hinnom. Now as our view shifts toward the north, we see the city of Jerusalem. By the time Jesus preached here, its people had turned away from the true God. They resisted Jesus' efforts to turn them back to true worship. For this reason, Jehovah abandoned them, and Jesus said that their house would be left desolate. Where this Muslim mosque with the gold dome is, Jehovah's temple once stood. What tragic evidence of the fruits of Babylonish religion! These narrow streets of Jerusalem no doubt resemble the ancient streets in which Jesus himself preached. People were just as occupied then with their daily tasks as they are today, so Jesus spoke quite frankly to them. He warned them of the time of trouble ahead and told them that they would lose their lives if they continued to follow the traditions of men instead of listening to God. He had a deep love for the people and viewed them as sheep that needed a shepherd. He gave the people of Jerusalem a marvelous opportunity to receive great blessings from Jehovah God, but they paid no heed. In those days, as today, people came to this pool of Siloam for water that flowed into the city through a tunnel from the spring of Gihon. Outside the city and across this Kidron Valley, Jesus met frequently with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. That garden is thought to have been in the vicinity of these olive trees, though the trees we see here have grown up since that time. In such a garden as this, Jesus instructed his disciples in true religion, teaching them how to worship their heavenly Father. As he did, he emphasized Jehovah's written word as the basis for true worship. This is called the Skull Place. You can see the caves that resemble the two eye sockets, also the nose and mouth. Apparently, Above this is where Jesus died after the religious clergy had clamored for his death. The political state bowed to their demands. His body was laid nearby in a newly cut tomb, a cave, which may have been this one. With Jesus dead, the false religious clergy thought they had silenced the proclamation of the good news. But a great work was yet to be done. On the third day, God raised Jesus from the dead to direct that proclamation work from heaven itself and there to sit at God's right hand. During forty days after his resurrection, he appeared at times to his disciples in materialized bodies. 
Then he ascended to heaven from what is thought to have been this spot where the tower is on the Mount of Olives. As we travel to the south, we come to Hebron, ancient capital of the nation of Israel. It was from here that King David, Jesus' ancestor, first ruled. He was a man who worshipped Jehovah and earnestly looked forward to the kingdom of the Messiah, or Christ. Ten centuries later, Jesus was born here in Bethlehem, the place where David himself had been born. A work began then of proclaiming the good news, and that work has not stopped down to this day. Right here in Bethlehem, as elsewhere, Jehovah's Witnesses are proclaiming the good news that Christ not only is the Savior for believing mankind, but is now ruling in the heavens with kingdom power. They find that today the people in this land of Bible history are as greatly in need of Bible instruction as were the people of Jesus' day. They need to be warned against Babylonish religion. They need to be encouraged in the reading of Jehovah's Word. The witness here is giving such encouragement by means of a free home Bible study. She's helping them to understand God's Word and to appreciate its importance to them. She points out the scripture where Jesus foretold the work of proclaiming the good news of the kingdom earthwide. He said, This good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. That work Jehovah's Witnesses are doing around the world. Before we leave Palestine, let's go back to Jerusalem for a few moments. We should remember this as a place where Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom of God and that at the cost of his own life. Now, what has he taught us? He taught that Jehovah is the true God, that our worship should be directed to him and that this worship is not passive, but that it moves us to proclaim the good news to others. But before we can, we must learn to recognize the marks of ancient Babylon and realize what Babylonish worship leads to. 500 miles to the east of Jerusalem lies the ruins of that notorious city, Babylon, condemned by God in prophecy now reduced to this desolate condition. Yet every civilization continues to bear the mark of Babylon. How has it affected your life? What will be the outcome? This map in the Convention Hall in New Delhi shows the around-the-world route we are following with the traveling proclaimers of everlasting good news. The beautiful hall you see here in New Delhi is the site of the Everlasting Good News Assembly. Witnesses have come from 27 countries. Brother Nor speaks to them about the Everlasting Good News. This news tells what the future holds for the world empire of Babylonish religion. Many of the people you see here were once in the grip of that false religion. At that time they worshipped animals and images. Some may even have shown violent intolerance toward other religions. But now they have turned away from such things. The Bible has changed their thinking. These Indian witnesses, dressed in colorful saris, go out to proclaim the liberating truths of Jehovah's Word. Curious Indian children invariably crowd about to hear what is being said. Here we are at the homes with Indian witnesses. These Christian witnesses do not show intolerance toward the householders who are in bondage to false religion, 
Instead, they go to them with a loving desire to help them, to show them what their Creator requires of them. This can be a blessing to them because Babylonish religion has long deprived them of their Creator's approval. Of course, they generally do not realize that, yet the evidences are everywhere. Cows wander freely about the streets of India. Do you know why? Because the cow is sacred in India, just as animals were sacred in ancient Babylon. Jehovah condemned such animal worship in times past, and it is just as hateful to him today. These busy streets are typical of India, which teems with a population of over 440 million people. These people have many different religions, bearing the mark of Babylon. Many of them are Hindus, did you know that they too worship a trinity? They do not call it Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, but Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva. Vishnu even wears a heart on his breast as some Catholic images do. India abounds with temples for its gods. Note the pillars and towers of this temple. They represent the lingam or male sex organ which is the symbol for the Hindu god Siva. Abominable Babylonish sex worship permeates religion in this country. In Burma too, we see many evidences of Babylonish religion. This tall golden structure is known as the Shui Dagon Pagoda. It and the spires around it symbolize the same thing as the towers on the Indian temple that we saw. This religious structure stands 326 feet high and is covered with gold leaf. Very often these structures enclose relics of Buddhist holy men. The Shui Dagon is said to contain the relics of Gautama and three previous Buddhas. Reference for relics is popular in the Far East, as it is with some religions in Christendom. So also is the use of rosaries or prayer beads. Shoes must be removed before one walks about this temple area because the ground is considered sacred. The people you see on their knees are worshipping images, which are another evidence in Burma of the influence of Babylonian religion. Like some people in Christendom, Buddhists and Hindus claim that images are used only as aids in religious concentration. Some, like this monk, may prefer to think of their belief as a philosophy of life, but to most it is a worship. Before an image with sightless eyes, deaf ears, and speechless mouth, they bow and pray. They ask help from an image that cannot even move to help itself, let alone those who worship it. No hope comes to them from this Babylonish religion. No love and kindness are engendered in their hearts. They burn candles before images that cannot see. Here, a gong reminds them to give money. But this money supports a religious system that will never give them life. From the same metal as is used in these images, the image worshipper makes his rickshaws and bicycles. In the case of wooden idols, the same tree is used to make an object of worship as is used to fuel a cooking fire. It is folly for a man with a mind to worship an idol that has no mind, that cannot think. Before them, worshippers meditate and pray with vain reputation, just as many in Christendom do. 
Condemning mechanical repetitions, the Bible says, Do not say the same thing over and over again, just as the people of the nations do, for they imagine they will get a hearing for the use of their many words. Such repetitious prayers are not heard by the true God and certainly cannot be heard by the deaf ears of these images. The use of images in worship is not upbuilding to the worshipers. It is detestable to the true God. His word, the Bible says, regarding images, those making them will become just like them, all those who are trusting in them. As they are lifeless, so their worshipers will become. Death is the fruit of Babylonish religion. This is the market in Rangoon, and these are people who worship before idols. They work hard at their jobs, but where does a lot of their money go? To support their costly temples. And for people like these, that can be a great burden. Some of them seem to be carefree, while the outlook of others is clouded by superstition. These religious structures that overshadow the streets are a constant reminder of the powerful grip of false religion. But in the Rangoon City Hall, we meet with Jehovah's Witnesses to consider what can be done to give real help to these people. And this is demonstrated for us on the assembly platform. True worship does not drain the people financially. It does not burden their hearts with superstitious fears and leave them without hope. But it liberates them. No longer do they use images, candles, relics, and repetitious prayers. Rather, as Brother Souter here points out, they worship the Creator, who is a spirit, and to Him they pray from the heart. Leaving the hall, some of the delegates go to the lake site where an immersion is to take place. These Burmese have responded to the help offered to them from the Bible. Being submerged beneath the water, they show that they have died to their former course of Babylonish worship. Guided now by the Bible, they have taken up the pure worship of the only true God. That means they will now be proclaimers of the everlasting good news. But it does not mean that they now eat or dress differently from others in Burma. They still wear sarongs, and after the immersion they slip off the wet garment under a dry one. For those gathered at this assembly, there is much work to be done. Temples of false worship surround them, and there are many other Burmese people who feel that they are doing what is right. They, as people everywhere, are unaware that their worship does not please Jehovah God. These are the ones that Jehovah's Witnesses are looking for. Moving on to Thailand, or Siam, we again find temples, and crowds of people come here to worship. But what is this place? It is called the Temple of the Dawn. The base of one of its five prangs, or pillars, is covered with religious figures in great number. At the top is an elaborate trident that symbolizes the god Siva. You will remember that he is a member of the Hindu trinity. The trident and the prangs all reveal the influence of abominable Babylonian sex worship. These are all phallic emblems that represent the male reproductive organ, called lingams by Hindus.
Nearby there is a smaller lingam, represented by an upright stone. Women who want children pray before this phallic emblem, burn incense to it, wash it with perfumed water, and decorate it with flowers. It was such sex worship that degraded the ancient Israelites, bringing upon them Jehovah God's anger. On their religious high places, they too set up phallic pillars. Now, do you see where Christendom got the spires for its churches? From much earlier religions. They all bear the mark of Babylonish sex worship. Terrifying images guard the entrance to one of the wats, or temple courtyards, where people come to worship. Inside one of them is a seemingly endless row of identical images. Christendom, too, has its images. Concerning them, the Roman Catholic Cardinal Newman made this admission. The use of temples, candles, holy water, incense, and images are all of pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption into the church. Images of giant size are just as deaf to the prayers of worship as are small images. They are just as powerless. Whether large or small, their worship is degrading for man. Filled with superstitious fears, some of the people build little spirit houses in their yards to appease spirits that they think might come into their homes and cause them harm. To get a better view of how the people here in Thailand actually live and work, let's charter a boat and go for a ride. We will find that many of the people here in Bangkok carry on nearly all affairs of life right here along the canals, which they call Klongs. Here, as elsewhere, we find religion. By giving food to the monks, the people feel they gain merit. But many of these people, some of whom they're making their living selling food from their boats, do not even realize how much religion dominates their lives. Some may view their beliefs simply as a philosophy of life. Others fear the supernatural. But what are the facts? God's word makes it clear that regardless of what they call it, their philosophy is a religious one, and their beliefs are a form of worship taken from Babylon. These people got their religion from their parents. That's true of most people, isn't it? And their lives are so filled with getting the material things of life that they have little time to consider whether their beliefs are right. The lives of these simple folk are built around their religion just as much as they are built around the Klongs. The canals furnish them water for their homes. They use it in many ways. They bathe in it, and it's the accepted thing. They wash their dishes and their clothes in it. Yet, though they may seem to have the things they need for life, their lives are endangered by their religion, the very thing they hold sacred. How can that be? Man's own creator has told us what the immediate future holds. And busy as people are, it is vital that they listen. Because in his inspired word, the Bible, he makes it very plain that false religious systems have lied to the people. They have misrepresented God and deprived the unsuspecting people of knowledge that means life. For this, all false religion will be forever destroyed. It is urgent for people everywhere 
matter, yes, even for this man in his rice paddy, to recognize the seriousness of the situation and make a clean break from false religion. That is why Jehovah God has arranged for the proclamation of the everlasting good news to people everywhere. And that is also why Jehovah's Witnesses are making this round the world convention tour. They have assembled here in Bangkok to help the sincere Thai people. As Brother North speaks to the assembly, he does so through an interpreter who is a graduate of Gilead School. He emphasizes what the Bible says about the impending destruction of all religion that is out of harmony with Jehovah God. He encourages them to show love for the people by helping them to embrace true worship now while there is yet time. To which the audience warmly responds. But what does that true worship require of one? Brother Souter discusses how we can draw close to God and the blessings that we will receive. You are looking at the harbor of Singapore, an island city off the coast of Malaya. Here, as in the other places we have visited, people are responding to the everlasting good news. They are being helped to worship the Creator rather than man and animals, as depicted on this Hindu temple. Really, if we want to serve the Creator, we ought to listen to Him when He tells us not to make religious images. So, if we want to please Jehovah God, we will not be worshiping in a place like this. The delegates to the assembly at the Victoria Theater direct their worship to Jehovah God. They will be particularly interested in the talk to be given by Brother Souter on the subject, Of which God are you a witness? He will tell them, In all the nations that came into existence after the flood of Noah's day, no real live God able to prophesy truly has been formed by the nations. Hence, after Jehovah, there has continued to be no God as He is. By plane, we leave Singapore for Bandung, Indonesia, our next stop. A comfortable hotel in Bandung receives us hospitably. Bandung is 120 miles by bus from the airport in Jakarta. On a tour, we see an immense volcanic crater built up from hardened lava. By means of such volcanoes, Jehovah formed these islands that provide a home for the people here. On terraced fields, rice is grown. Although man plants and cultivates, Jehovah is the actual provider of the food. He created the soil and the sun for our good. In appreciation, we worship Him as a personal God. And that is why we go to the assembly, too, to learn more about Him. This family has come by means of a rickshaw. The family head realizes that he has to do more than work for their material needs. He must also see to it that they are cared for in a spiritual way. So he brings the entire family to the assembly. True worship is not something simply for women and children. It appeals to the entire family. Even here we have to eat, and provision is made for that right at the assembly. Of course, in this land, rice is a principal part of the diet. And these people have not changed in this regard. In fact, these Christian women are quite deft in tossing the rice as they clean it. Since this is something they know how to do well, 
they are glad to volunteer to help prepare the meals for their Christian brothers here at the assembly. Yes, they are all volunteers, but we are going to have more than rice on the menu. Here, willing hands chop up some meat and vegetables to go with the rice. So we will have a little variety. But whether we have one dish or many, we give thanks to the one who provides our needs. Not only when we gather for study, but also before each meal, we pause to give thanks to God. That is part of true worship. Do you use any of the foods you have seen here? Do you squeeze out coconut milk in this fashion? That's the way it's done here in Bangdong, and this food sustains the life of these people. But the most important food is the spiritual, and it is to this that Brother Souter directs the attention of the assembly. This is what really changes one's life. At this immersion pool, you see persons who have taken time in their busy lives to learn what Jehovah God says to man through his written word. Understanding what he requires of them, they have dedicated their lives to him and symbolize that by immersion. From now on, young and old alike, they will put spiritual matters first. Not that they will ignore their material needs, but they will not allow them to crowd God out of their lives. At the conclusion of the assembly, Indonesian witnesses board a train for the trip home. They leave Bangdan with increased knowledge of the true God and greater understanding of his requirements for them personally. When they arrive home, they will continue their careful study of the Bible both personally and with their local congregations, and even more zealously than before, they will share in proclaiming the everlasting good news to all who hear it. While they are traveling home, we must be on our way by plane to our next stop. Where do you think we are now? in the land down under the equator, Australia, the home of kangaroos. How would you like to cuddle that lovable cola bear? Bashful, isn't he? The convention talk, when God is king over all the earth, is good news that the people of Melbourne too must hear. This message embodies the same truths that Christ Jesus preached. People of all sorts flocked to hear him, and he told that the kingdom of the heavens has drawn near. And how appropriate that was, because he, the king, was in their midst. The message that began with him continues to attract large crowds right down to this day. Gathered in midwinter in this place known as the Sheep Pavilion are thousands of devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Because of their mildness of temper, Jesus likened them to sheep and himself to their loving shepherd. Brother Franz directs the minds of his audience to those things taught by Jesus. Jesus Christ constantly made reference to the scriptures as authority for his teaching. He said of God's inspired word, Your word is truth. And Jehovah's Witnesses feel exactly the same way about the Bible today. As was done at earlier assemblies, Brother Franz releases the new study aid, All scripture is inspired of God and beneficial to this appreciative audience. It will help them to use the Bible, and that is the book that can help us to conform our lives to the will of God. A 
A talk on baptism clearly points out that when we understand what God's will is, we must dedicate ourselves to Jehovah. This is demonstrated by baptism, in imitation of Jesus. Standing up, these candidates answer two questions to show their readiness for baptism. First, do you recognize your need for salvation as provided through Jesus Christ? Then, have you dedicated yourself to do Jehovah's will as revealed in the Bible? They are now ready for immersion and so leave the assembly hall for the immersion pool. Those who submit to Christian water baptism come from all walks of life. They are those of advanced years and youth. But now, what significance do they attach to this baptism? Do they feel that it is the way to gain forgiveness of sins? No, that water will not wash sins away. But baptism is simply a symbol of their dedication to Jehovah, and it shows their faith in Jesus, their exemplar. They believe that it is by faith in his shed blood that they gain forgiveness of sins. After baptism, they endeavor to live in harmony with that faith. They may make mistakes, but they are determined that such conduct as drunkenness, fornication, and lying will not be a part of their lives. When Brother Souter is introduced to the assembly, he again focuses their attention on the kingdom of God. He urges them to take note of the fact that through his anointed son Jesus, Jehovah, the righteous God, will cleanse the earth of all who do not prove their course of life now that they love righteousness. How urgent that we take our stand on his side now. From Australia, Brother Souter came here to New Zealand. He releases to the assembled delegates the booklet, Living in Hope of a Righteous New World, shown here by an enlarged replica. With such a glorious prospect set before us, how foolish it would be to not serve Jehovah now. On the second evening of the assembly, Brother Franz is due to arrive at the assembly hall from Australia. As evidence that all kinds of people are seeking first the kingdom of God, we have these Maoris. They are descendants of the early inhabitants of New Zealand, and 700 of them are now Jehovah's Witnesses. These that you see here are dressed in their native costumes, and they are giving Brother Franz a song and dance of welcome in midwinter. This is their way of expressing their appreciation for his coming to New Zealand to give them instruction in the everlasting good news. As they continue their dance, Brother Franz waves a greeting to them. It is easy to see that they're happy people, but what has done the most to increase that happiness is the Word of God. It has given them a real purpose in living. It has helped them to learn that the greatest happiness comes in doing things for others. So they give of themselves in warm greetings to their Christian brothers, and they also give freely by sharing in the proclamation of the good news of God's kingdom. In Maury fashion, a Christian brother and each of the dancers greet Brother Franz by rubbing noses. He turns to Brother Souter and asks, Did you do this? Witnesses around the world have different customs, but all have the same faith. They all have one spirit, and they move forward as a united people in their service to God. 
Busy as they are in the ministry, Jehovah's Witnesses are not so busy that they do not have time to enjoy some of the beauties of creation around them. So during our visit here in Auckland, we stop to see a fascinating indoor garden. But we see it with deeper appreciation than most visitors would, because we see it in evidence of the handiwork of our God. Like their God, those who serve here at the New Zealand branch of the Watchtower Society are workers. They spend all of their time advancing the true worship in this land. But they are not the only ones doing this work. Thousands of Jehovah's Witnesses in this country have family obligations. Yet they too share in the ministry, using as much time as they can. The Civic Theater is one of two places being used for the Everlasting Good News Assembly here. It is the finest theater in New Zealand and was obtained only after much effort. It and the town hall a block away were engaged to handle the crowds of delegates because there simply was not enough room in one hall. Inside the town hall, the program duplicates the one in the Civic Theater. The zealous activity of these proclaimers of the everlasting good news has attracted much attention, and just about everyone in the country knows about the assembly, whether as a result of a personal visit by an assembly delegate, or through radio or TV broadcasts. Those who attended the assembly were given much to think about when they heard the message, Babylon the Great has fallen, God's kingdom rules. In this city of Auckland, as well as in Australia, witnesses have recognized the urgency of this message and many have moved out to other islands to preach to the people there. Some of the results of their ministry can be seen in Fiji. It is a delight to be able to visit these Pacific Islanders. They are a warm and friendly group, and many have come from distant places for the assembly here in Fiji. And it's a beautiful place to come to, isn't it? But the greatest beauty lies in the people, those who have taken up the worship of Jehovah. Brother Franz, speaking through a Fijian translator, discusses with all of us here the time when national boundaries will be a thing of the past. But Christian unity is not something that awaits the future. Already, a great crowd of people out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues have joined together around the earth united by the worship of the one true God. Racial inequalities are a thing of the past among Jehovah's Witnesses. No one looks down on the other. They are all Christian brothers. That this is a reality among them is strikingly demonstrated by the Around the World Assembly, where people of many nations have traveled together, lived together, and worked together in unity. Well, we don't like to leave these folks, but as we prepare to go, our brothers sing for us songs of praise to Jehovah in their native tongue. How our hearts go out to these people, because they too are servants of God. But what are the other world travelers doing in Hong Kong? When brothers Franz and Suter left Thailand on the southern tour on the Fiji Islands, brother Nor and others took the northern tour. Let's join them now. We are approaching Hong Kong just off the China coast. This British colony bulges with three and a half million people, most of whom are Chinese. The city you see here is Victoria, the principal one on the island. As Jesus went to the common people and preached even in congested streets, so Jehovah's Witnesses do in Hong Kong. 
Some apartments have as many as 30 persons crowded in them, and the stairways are so dark you have to feel your way to the door. These are some of the problems met in preaching in Hong Kong. Let's look in on one of these witnesses at a door. Enthusiastic, isn't he? Outside we go to the marketplace too. Why must the good news be preached here? Because people are here, and we are interested in people. This message means life to them. Many who cannot be found in their homes practically live here. Of course, in crowded apartment houses, we do find some people home, but the message is important, and we want to talk to everyone. So we call again and again at the homes, because we meet different ones in the family. And at certain times, people are just more receptive than at others. And then they are glad that we come back. So many people live in Hong Kong that they overflow into the harbor. Not only work here, but even live on these boats. In fact, here is a complete community on water. They have shops, schools, and clinics right on the boats. Now here is a problem. How do you preach to these people? Well, you can do it from a boat, and you can meet some at the docks, but when someone shows interest, we want to see him again to help him study the Bible. But how can you do that when people are always on the move? Well, it takes planning and real love for the people. These are hard-working people who move about the harbor in motor-driven junks and in smaller sampans and often they too have the whole family with them. How would you like to grow up on a boat like these youngsters? These parents have to work hard to raise their family, but busy as they are, there are some who really want to know who the true God is and what he requires of them, and they take time to study the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses. The good news is proclaimed to all types of people, even to those seeking escape from reality. Some of them are in this village near the border of communist China. While one can preach freely here, across the border in the distance is a land with a government that hates Jehovah's kingdom. There are some people there in communist China who talk to others about the Bible as they are able, but they are persecuted because the communist government fears to have people learn what the Bible says. In Hong Kong City Hall, Brother North's talk to the Everlasting Good News Assembly is translated into Chinese by a Gilead graduate who received training and returned here to help his own people. Well, it's time to leave our brothers in Hong Kong because we have more to see. So we head out toward the South China Sea and the Philippines. Brother Nor and his wife arrive in Manila on another plane with other conventioneers. A typhoon lashed the city the day before, but in spite of that, the convention is ready to open at the Rizal Memorial Football Stadium. What a thrill it is to be here. But of course, conventions are not the only times Jehovah's Witnesses meet together. Several times a week, these people gather in their local kingdom halls. Of course, not in such large numbers as these. There, too, they study the Bible. A graduate of Gilead School opens the assembly. Over 13,000 are here for the first session, glad to hear the talks, 
but also grateful to have this roof over their heads. Their brothers built this entire roof for the seating area because they knew it would make it possible for those who came here to get more out of the program. It was a tremendous job, but it is the fine Bible instruction they receive every week in their kingdom halls that has taught these people to work together in unity and to show real love for one another. Because this spirit prevails among Jehovah's Witnesses, this branch office of the Society in the Philippines has seen the number of witnesses here grow from a few in 1940 to over 30,000 today. All these witnesses are ministers. They're commissioned to teach the truth of the Bible to others. But they do not wait for others to come to them. They go to the people. Many of the people spend all day working in the rice fields, so these ministers meet them there. Their sincere interest in the people moves them to search them out wherever they are. It is vital that even these men in the rice paddy hear the Bible's urgent message. Many of them appreciate the effort put forth to help them, and though they have worked long hours perhaps transplanting rice like this young fellow, many sense the importance of the message and accept the invitation to attend meetings where they can learn more about the Bible. A vast crowd of them come along to this assembly in Manila. Approximately 12,000 are present who are not Jehovah's Witnesses. They have come from the various language groups and they appreciate the fact that arrangements are made for them to hear the kingdom message in their own language. To the 37,000 persons present, Brother Knorr offers a free copy of his public address, and God is king over all the earth. On this last day of the assembly, the stadium was packed, and two-thirds of these earnest people are ministers. They are not preachers who set aside the Bible and advocate their own philosophy. They have strong faith in God. Some are well along in years, but they have not lost faith, nor have they stopped learning. They continue to improve their ability to use the Bible in teaching others. There are children here, too. Their parents have brought them because they know that they will find the greatest happiness as servants of God, and early training is vital. Their entire life revolves around their service to God. More of these fine Oriental people are waiting for us in Taiwan, and we would like you to meet them too. In Taiwan, off the China coast, signs welcome us as soon as we step off the plane. But more than signs greet us, our brothers are here, and they have arranged everything to make our stay a delightful one. How grand it is to be part of the worldwide family of Jehovah's people. Crowds of local witnesses spontaneously greet us with such warmth that language seems to be no barrier. These humble mountain people are deeply impressed that their Christian brothers cared enough for them to travel around the world to join them at their assembly. They just insist on shaking hands with one another. But where is the assembly going to be held? Does this look like a good spot? There is no stadium here where we can meet, so in this little village of Shofang, with a beautiful mountain backdrop, our brothers have built their own. Sturdy bamboo poles with canvas over the top serves the purpose, certainly a most fitting setting in which to discuss the Word of God, isn't it? The languages spoken here are Chinese and Ami, but the message is the same. 
There is no mixing of pagan rites with the true worship of Jehovah God. Those who take up true worship must forsake everything that pertains to the false. These people have done just that, making their minds over in harmony with the word of God. For some, this meant discarding idols and religious pictures. Others threw away their good luck charms and abandoned superstitious rituals. Indeed, the Bible has had a tremendous effect on their lives. But changed as their thinking is, here too the native way of life continues. So with these simple facilities, they operate a cafeteria to feed the 1,500 assembly delegates. While we are here in Taiwan, our brothers want us to see some of the beauty of the land. So they take us to the impressive Taroka Gorge, which cuts across the island. The cliffs tower far above us, dwarfing us in size. As we travel along the Cross Island Highway, we pass through tunnels to vantage points from which we can gain breathtaking views of the majesty of the handiwork of God. As the psalmist said, How many your works are, O Jehovah! All of them in wisdom you have made. Just as solid as these cliffs of marble, so are the promises of Jehovah God. Those who rest their confidence in him will not be disappointed. In a small village, we stopped to see a kingdom hall used by a local congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Not only are they provided with education in the Bible, but they are also taught to read and to write their language. One of these charts in the Kingdom Hall shows the progress that the congregation is making in this program. As we leave Taiwan, memories of the warmth shown by the humble witnesses of this island go with us. It is not to be forgotten. We need never fear that these brothers of ours will drop bombs on our homes. Neither need they fear that their Christian brothers will do that to them. As followers of Jesus, we love one another. Famous Mount Fuji indicates that we are now in Japan. From the airport, we go to the city of Kyoto, where the assembly is being held. For most of us, it is a new experience to visit these interesting oriental lands. Here at the cafeteria, we see some wearing beautiful kimonos. When it comes to eating, chopsticks are in order. Do you think you can make them work? Of course, once in a while they do have their problems with those chopsticks. Children are the same the world over, aren't they? These are a gracious and friendly people, and it is a pleasure to be with them. Let's go along with these Christian brothers of ours to the assembly hall. Look at that platform. Have you noticed the variety of design we have seen around the world? As at all other assemblies, one of the highlights of the program here in Japan is the immersion, because people everywhere are taking up true worship. But what kind of people are getting baptized here? One used to be a Shinto priest. Another was an entertainer. And it may surprise you to know that one American woman here came to Japan before she learned what the Bible teaches. The lives of all these people have been changed. They are being baptized today.
Now they call it the homes of the people to talk about Jehovah God. They point out to them the marvelous blessings that he holds out to those who serve him. They make it clear that serving the true God acceptably requires a complete change in one's thinking. Anyone who has been raised in a false religious environment becomes saturated with its thinking. Now he must make his mind over. For example, many Orientals have been taught that this lotus flower is a symbol in their sex worship. But God did not make it for such a purpose, did he? And when a person puts out of his mind those unclean religious ideas, he can begin to see the beauty of it as one of God's creations. With their changed thinking, they also realize that while it is right to have a place to meet, ornate temples are not vital for true worship. And what about their prayers? They do not tie written prayers on a branch like this, but true Christians certainly do pray. They pray earnestly to Jehovah through his son Jesus. No longer do they superstitiously light candles before an altar or use holy water. All these marks of Babylonish religion are out of their lives. As we sit down in a restaurant with its typical Japanese entertainment, we have much to think about. To be sure, we have found the Orient quite different from other parts of the world, but greater than this difference is the difference between the life of a servant of Jehovah God and that of one who practices Babylonish religion. From Japan, we leave by plane for Korea, our next stop in this Around the World Assembly. We are approaching Seoul, the capital city of Korea. In this oriental country, thousands are hearing and accepting the good news of Jehovah's Kingdom. As we get off the plane, we find that our visit is causing a stir. 456 convention travelers arriving in this country form the largest tourist group ever to come to Korea. Officials give us special red carpet treatment which we appreciate, but now we are anxious to meet our brothers. A police escort speeds our buses through the city and to our hotel. On each bus is a banner advertising the public talk, when God is king over all the earth. Yes, the same Bible message is preached by Jehovah's Witnesses here as in every other land. At Citizens Hall, we find the assembly already underway. Nearly all the more than 5,000 witnesses of Jehovah in Korea are here. What appreciation they have for Jehovah's provisions. They do not have a lot of money to spare, so it calls for careful planning when whole families travel to assemblies such as these. But they save carefully so they can all be on hand. They have found genuine Christian love among Jehovah's Witnesses and a strong bond of unity that makes it a pleasure for them to be together. What has brought this about? Brother Bible, a graduate of Gilead School, discusses the very thing that has produced this unity. In fact, that Jehovah is their God, they all look to him for instruction through his word, so they all believe the same thing. As he has shown love for them, they love others. And they are united in the one work of bearing witness to his name and purpose. So they are at unity, first of all with Jehovah God, and then with those who love and serve him. No wonder they enjoy being together. These volunteer workers certainly reflect that happiness that comes from Christian unity. 
As they squat here on the ground and prepare food for the assembly cafeteria, they have a good time just doing things together. While some prepare food, others bring in supplies, such as this bag of bean sprouts, an important item of Korean food. In great quantities, they are prepared in Korean fashion, and many adobe stoves are used for the cooking. At last, the meal is ready, and one after another, the trays are filled for the delegates. The principal item on the menu is rice, of course, as it is in so many parts of the world. The Korean people work hard, and they do all kinds of work as we see on a walk through Seoul. Our brothers, too, work at various jobs, but when it comes to their service to God, they are a united people. In unity, they carry on their ministry. The center for this preaching work in Korea is this branch office of the society. It was damaged during the Korean War and still has shrapnel marks in its bricks. But Jehovah's Witnesses, no matter what their nationality, do not take up sword one against another. They are united subjects of the kingdom of God. Leaving the branch and boarding a plane, we are soon on our way to Hawaii. How peaceful it is to sit back in our seats and enjoy the colors of the sunset. Won't it be grand when God has wiped out all wickedness and peaceful conditions prevail everywhere? As we come into Hawaii, we cannot help but think of the many other places we would also like to visit someday. How fine it would be, after all wickedness is gone, to visit other lands. In that new system, everyone who greets us will be a fellow worshiper of Jehovah. The earth will be a paradise, and what variety there will be. The sea itself is a constantly changing wonder. Mountains, forests, and fertile plains will all be part of that paradise that will encircle the globe. With the blessing of Jehovah God, the land will be productive. It is true that even today we often have good crops, such as this pineapple crop in Hawaii. But there is insecurity, isn't there? There is always the fear of a drought or an untimely storm that can ruin it all. Those things will not mar life in that new system of things because God himself will bless our work. Today, men like these work hard and may bring in a good crop, but people everywhere may go hungry. Why? Because of selfish commerce and national boundaries. But those divisive things are going to be removed from this earth. It will become true then, as the psalmist long ago foretold, God himself will show us favor and bless us. The earth itself will certainly give its produce. God, our God, will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. In that new water, neither sugarcane farmers nor you will have to fear being out of a job. There will be no unemployed people lacking the necessities of life. What kind of work do you like to do? In the open fields or processing the products of the earth as is done in this Hawaiian sugarcane plant? There will be a variety of things to do and we will find pleasure in the work of our hands. But we won't be so rushed that we won't have the time to do other things. A swim here at Waikiki Beach would be refreshing, wouldn't it? There will be time for those things too in God's new order. But will you be there? If so, prove your love for Jehovah God now as one of his witnesses 
telling others about his kingdom as these people are doing. The result will be more praisers of Jehovah as shown on this chart of congregations in Hawaii. If you want to gain life in God's promised new order of things, now is the time to number yourself among those who believe in that righteous arrangement. As Brother Franz emphasizes to all those who have gathered at this assembly, the time is near at hand when God will execute judgment on the entire empire of false religion. Even those who claim that they have no religion will perish. Only those who worship Jehovah God in harmony with his word will survive to gain the blessing of eternal life. Many who want to be among those survivors are here at Waikiki Shell on this final day of the assembly. Though the sun is hot, they are on hand for the talk when Brother Nor sets out the blessings that will be the lot of those who live when God rules as king over all the earth. Not only the large visible audience hear that message, but it is carried by television throughout the island because the message is vital for all persons. The speaker urges them to take a firm stand now for the kingdom of God, but that may not be easy. What would you do if your own family opposed you? Many that you see here at this assembly have faced that problem, but they know that nothing must come between them and their God, Jehovah. Or what would you do if neighbors or clergymen were to ridicule your new faith? Remember, the Bible says that all who live as true Christians will be persecuted, so this is to be expected. Yet, even if ungodly men should kill you, you have nothing to fear as a servant of God. Jehovah is the giver of life, and he will even raise from the dead all who prove faithful to the end. As we leave Hawaii headed for the last stop of this around the world assembly, we have much to think about, don't we? This is Pasadena on the west coast of the United States. Here we are meeting with representatives from 43 lands at the world famous Rose Bowl. Do you realize that at all the stops made by this assembly, we have associated with delegates from a total of 161 lands. Near the Rose Bowl, our Spanish speaking brothers are enjoying the same program. Many of them have come from Central and South America. They too have adopted the resolution presented at all the assemblies around the world, declaring themselves unequivocally for the kingdom of God and in harmony with his judgment against this wicked old world. A total of more than 454,000 conventioners endorsed that resolution. On that final day, the largest crowd at any session around the world gather here. With signs greeting them from Canada, Mexico, and many other places. Over 118,000 filled the Rose Bowl to hear that now famous discourse, When God is King over all the earth. Around the world, a total of more than 580,000 heard this thrilling message. As we have traveled with this assembly, you have seen how religions, inside and outside of Christendom, have the mark of ancient Babylon. You have seen how the world empire of false religion has opposed and continues to oppose true worship. You have also seen how the truth of Jehovah's Word is being proclaimed around the world. 
This proclamation of good news is the most important work in our day. Why not share in it? At the Watchtower Society's headquarters in New York, Gilead School is doing much to further that worldwide proclamation. The school is located in this building. Witnesses are brought here from all parts of the world for an intensive course of study in the Bible and in the work of overseers, and this has a unifying effect on the organization. Today is graduation day. It marks the end of 10 months in which students have enjoyed not only classroom instruction, but beneficial association with those who have faithfully served Jehovah here at Brooklyn Bethel for many years. Now they have all gathered for the graduation program. As the program gets underway, Brother Knorr invites Brother Souter to the platform to read the telegrams that have been received. Around the world, there is keen interest in this school, and their greetings are a source of real enjoyment to the 38th class. Brother Franz talks to them about the urgency of the preaching work that must be done. He makes it very clear that after the annihilation of false religion, it will be too late for people to flock into Jehovah's organization. Now is the time to help them by proclaiming the everlasting good news. Brother Knorr, the next speaker, emphasizes what the Bible says about paying more than the usual attention to these things. Yes, more than usual attention, not only hearing them, but believing them and acting on them shaping our whole life around them. These students graduating from Gilead School are doing just that. They are men and women who believe these things, so they are being sent out to pass on to others in all the lands where they serve the instruction that they have received. The result is that everywhere the overseers among Jehovah's Witnesses view things alike. They teach the same truths. They're able to offer the same help. So no matter where you live, there are qualified ministers of Jehovah God who are ready to help you to stand boldly for true worship. Jesus said the field is the world. There the good news is being preached. Will you share in that work? Wherever there are people you can share in proclaiming the everlasting good news, Jehovah's Witnesses preach to storekeepers and people in busy city streets in every land, as you can too. People who have every conceivable type of occupation, whether they are hardworking housewives or businessmen on the move, all need to learn about the Creator. The message of God's kingdom is for people of every nationality and all races without distinction. Regardless of their religious beliefs, they must hear. Even those who as refugees flee from their homeland are soon to be called on by Jehovah's Witnesses with the good news. Are you one who travels a great deal, or do you spend your life at home on the farm? Whether in the country or in a busy town, you can share in the service of God. Around the world, the good news is being preached. It is to these people that Jehovah's Witnesses go to help them break free from bondage to religion that bears the mark of Babylon, the enemy of God. Yes, ancient Babylon is gone, but its false religion remains. Multitudes have seen it for what it is and have left it behind. When God brings destruction on all religion that does not honor Him, 
they will have nothing to fear. But where will you be? Now is the time to get out of Babylon the Great, the world empire of false religion. Amen.